one of the principles of biblical justice is that God is loath to punish someone who admits wrong. I want to say this again. God is loath to punish someone who admits their wrong, who admits their guilt. And what do we find? We don't find anybody taking responsibility. I mean, Hamas and all the Palestinians and all the people who are pro-Palestine, they will say they're not wrong because they claim that Israel is militarily occupying their land. Isn't that interesting? They're occupying their land. But the Muslims never think, hey, you're occupying Afghanistan, which is a Buddhist land. You're occupying Indonesia, now the largest Muslim country in the world, and that's uh, used to be Hindu land. You're occupying so much of India, and that's obviously in Hindu land, right? How come they don't mention that? They're, they're occupying Turkey. Turkey is Christian land. That belongs to us. We got proof. All seven churches of the book of Revelation are in present-day Turkey. So they slaughtered the people that used to live in Constantinople, which is named after another Christian, and slaughtered them, made them all refugees, and then took over the land, Christian land of Turkey. Uh, we don't hear anything about that. And on and on. Syria used to be Christian. That's where the Bible says people were first known, followers of Jesus were first labeled Christian. It was like a derogatory thing. You are, you think you're a little Christ. You're a little anointed one. You're like Jesus. So you're a Christian. And that was in Syria. So Syria is occupied territory. Muslims occupy a Christian land of Syria. On and on it goes. The biggest library in the world used to be in Egypt. Many of the great Christian scholars used to be in Alexandria. It's now been occupied by Muslims. But we never hear any of that. The one tiny sliver of, of property that has had deep historical biblical tie to Judaism and the Jewish Messiah and his followers, that little piece of land, they want to say, oh, the Jews have occupied that. Well, you remember the Jews lived there before? They built temples there before. They had a great kingdom there before. There was no Muslim kingdom there. There was no Palestinian nation there. But they go on and on. And, and the young people are not taught enough of the history to have some sympathy and some common sense about this. So, Let's go back to the biblical principle of justice, because I hear that there are some ministers getting onto the edge of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom. That's awesome. But so what now? If you know that the king is coming and the kingdom is within us, then what? Well, we have to be active agents of justice on the earth. We have to look at these tragedies through the prism or through the perspective of biblical justice. So one of the principles I said is God is loath to punish people who admit their wrong. Hamas will not admit that they're wrong because they say Israel is occupying their land. And that's so debatable. Israel, now this is the part that's difficult for people to get. Israel won't admit that they're wrong because they will claim that Hamas started it first. Right? Hamas started first, which is true. They start attacking the civilians. But you know what it's like as a pastor? It's like listening to a husband and wife argue over their divorce. You know, the the... The man will say, well, she, she's lying and she's manipulative. And, and, and the woman will say, oh, yeah, but he's verbally abusive to me. And he'll say, well, you, you, she doesn't submit to me like the Bible says. And he'll say, well, if you, if you love me like the Bible said, then I would submit to you. So on and on it goes. You hear this bickering and this uh, fault finding and blame shifting. And you realize God will punish both of them. You realize that God will punish both of them. That's the biblical perspective because nobody accepts responsibility. You say, well, how can you, how can you say anything about Israel? Israel is a victim. Yeah, Israel was a victim of deportation in the Old Testament. Israel was also a victim of their city being totally annihilated in 70 AD. Uh, Israel was a victim in the Holocaust. And each and every time the Bible says, other than the World War II one, the Bible says that Israel was being punished for her sins. Now, the one in 70 AD, they don't know the New Testament identified the sin. It was the sin of rejecting the Messiah. So because the Messiah is supposed to come before the second temple is destroyed, Jesus said, <clears throat> it's so obvious. And since you don't accept me, I'm going to allow the second temple to be destroyed and Jerusalem to be burned with fire. And then you will have no more excuse to say, we're waiting for another Messiah because no other Messiah can come. Either he already came before the second temple was destroyed, 
or he will never come. Which one is it? And the Torah is right, right? So we cannot say that the Messiah is not going to come. That leaves only one option, that he has come. Clearly, Israel has a long history of a broken relationship with God. And God loves Israel, and God is trying to call her back. Let me go to a scripture, okay? Isaiah chapter 30. I think this is a word in season. The Bible says in verse 18, Therefore the Lord will wait, that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Well, why is it that he says he's waiting? Because you have to look a couple of verses earlier. What it says is Israel doesn't really follow the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, but you would not. See, Teshuva, God says, Teshuva, do Teshuva, do repentance and come back to the Messiah, but they would not. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee and we shall ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. The Lord says, one thousand shall flee at the threat of one. And at the threat of five, you shall flee. Till you are left as a pole on top of a mountain and as a banner on a hill. Then he says, therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. The Lord wants to be gracious to Israel, but Israel has to do teshuva, has to repent. They say, well, what, what do you have to repent of? Well, let me give you a perspective that you've not heard. And I've not seen anybody say this, so let me share it with you. You see Jews dancing to a metallic statue of Buddha. And they're writhing and, 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 and showing their bodies. And they're on drugs and having sex in the open field. What does the Bible say about this? I know this is tough. Maybe some people will say, don't speak about these things. Well, I'm, I'm just going to quote the Bible to you. What does the Bible say? I'm going to read to you Exodus chapter 32. This is the golden calf incident where the nation of Israel were at the bottom. Moses is at the top getting the Ten Commandments and they're at the bottom. I take tours to this place. You can come with me to Saudi Arabia and see this very place. It's extremely significant because whatever happened in the Old Testament, it's happening again. And the Bible says that when Aaron made the golden calf, then they said, in verse 4, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Imagine, they still say they're, they're doing this to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Very interesting. It says very early in the morning. How early is that? How about 6 a.m.? This rave party, this nature party was going on at 6 a.m. Did anybody pause to ask why they were outside dancing in the desert at 6 a.m.? Why has nobody said anything about this? Why is it that we're, we're so spiritually insensitive to what the Bible says? Well, what does it mean that they were that they were playing. Interesting, the Bible actually uses a word much like rave. It says that in the Jerusalem Bible, they got up to indulge in revelry. The CEV says they carry, they began to carry on like wild people. The ERV says they had a wild party. The EXB says 
They sat down to eat and drink. Then they got up and sinned sexually. They got up and amused themselves and rose up to play a euphemism. Listen to the God's word translation. It says they sat down to a feast which turned into an orgy. One more. The Good News translation says the people sat down to a feast and it turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. So what happened in Exodus 32? When God looked down on his chosen people, his nation, and saw them naked and having an orgy at the foot of Mount Sinai in the desert. God was very upset. And God called the Levites and said, go and kill your brothers. And they ended up killing 3,000 of them. And near the foot of Mount Sinai, there's a cemetery where I can take you and show you gravestones in the middle of the desert, which is against the custom, not part of the custom of the Bedouins. What are they doing there? We found the real location of Mount Sinai, and it speaks of today. What should we do? The Bible says at the end of Exodus chapter 32, that on top of the Levites killing their own brothers, the Lord plagued Israel. The Lord is not happy. How do you raise your children who are called of God to go out and show their skin at 6 a.m. in the morning? They've been drinking and doing drugs all night. And they're showing themselves. Now, hey, if you're not a Jew, you're, you're not a believer in Torah, I guess it doesn't matter. That's how you were raised. But how do you raise children who give themselves up to casual sex and recreational drugs on a regular basis? And this is the chosen nation of God. Do you think that maybe from God's perspective, that this is a nation that is rebellious and has turned away from him and he's waiting to show mercy? And he's waiting for them to return and come back. I've got three girls. I'm raising three girls and none of them would have this kind of behavior. We're not raising kids to have a free for all sex, to do whatever you want, not as people of God. And we're not legalistic about it, but we set moral standards and we help guide them. So what happened to Israel? What happened to all this? I think there's repentance that needs that needs to happen. Now, the Islamics, or the Islamists, they look at this, and you know what they say. When they see Western ladies dressed in, in tights and, and barely covering their bodies and showing every curve until there's nothing left for, the, for a young man to imagine, well, they call those girls whores. That's what the Islamists consider Western people. And of course, Westernized nation. Israel is very Westernized. So are they wrong biblically? If God looked down on both sides, do not both sides have a problem? I don't say anybody deserves to die the way they did. The Palestinian terrorists did. You you must not misunderstand, right? But the Bible says very clearly, God was upset when they had an orgy in the desert in the morning. And that's what a nature party is with a Buddha, no less. And this is a sensitive issue for me because I saw a lot of Jews come into Thailand. You know, I'm half Thai. I'm born again in Thailand. And I wrote a whole book called From Buddha to Jesus because one of the things I observed was that you couldn't reach Jews with the gospel or the name of Jesus. They they would make fun of Jesus. They would even say you can't be a Jew and be a believer in Jesus, even though he's the Jewish Messiah. They hate him so much, they say he's boiling in his own feces in hell right now. And they curse him every day when they're in the synagogue. And yet, you can be a Buju. You can be a Jew who follows Buddha and raves and dances almost naked in front of a metal Buddha statue. And that's fine. You can be a Buddhist Jew. You can be a sinning Jew. You can be a sexual Jew. But you can't be a messianic Jew. How do you think God sees that? I'm going to go one step further. Because I've been been watching this and I see the grief and the sympathy and the outpouring. And I'm a bit suspicious right now. How is it that the whole world 
is now suddenly on the side of Israel. I, I don't think this is, this is going to last, and I don't think this is the real agenda. But right now, we see people really sympathizing with Israel, as I think people should. I sympathize. I love Israel. I take tours to Israel. I haven't done it recently, and I thank God I haven't, because I don't feel like it's the right timing. But I love the Jews, and that's why I take people to Israel. But having said that, the Jews have rejected Jesus for 2,000 years. And why is it that the whole world sympathizes, and I mean the Western world sympathizes with what's going on there, and yet we can't even get anything out about the Christians that are being slaughtered in East India, in Manipur. On almost a daily basis, prior to the Islam, Islamic terror event in Israel, I've been getting messages that show Christians being beheaded. Today, I got a, a video of a Christian being burned alive in East India by the Hindus, as vicious as the Palestinians, but more so because this has been going on for like three, four months, Contin continuously. They've burned the Christians' homes, the Christians' churches, and, and raped the two women that we saw on video, that was actually in India news when it's raping women, they, they showed that, but, but, and I had the video of that as well. I couldn't show even a sanitized version of that. YouTube immediately took it off. Twitter said it violates their policy. And day after day, I've been watching videos of Jews who are shot, who are hunted down, it's despicable. If we are believers in Messiah, we have to believe there's, as much as we love Israel, all human life has equal value. And I'm not going to be more in grief over people who deny Jesus and hate Jesus than over people who are standing up for their faith in Jesus and saying, you can kill me, but I will not deny Jesus. And they lose their limb. They're tortured. They, have, they lose everything and they're killed. I mean, if you have more, more grief and more sympathy for the Jews right now, for what they're going through, then the slaughter of Christians, Christians, brothers and sisters in India, you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with your faith? What's wrong with your faith? Are we supposed to support people who reject and blaspheme God's name? I mean, let's just say these girls and these young people, it's a tragedy what happened to them, but they should have returned and their family needs to return not even to the Messiah. They need to return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew the Messiah in advance and knew Yeshua in advance. Are we not supposed to support all of these brothers and sisters that are in pain and they're, they're fleeing right now? They don't have any American aircraft carriers to come get them. They don't have any money. They don't have any weapons. If, if any of them had guns, they could defend themselves. I watched a video of a Christian boy that was hacked to death limb by limb. And he's, he's moving like a dog on the ground. And this is the viciousness and the vileness of these Hindus. And so there's not an outcry and you can't even see it. I've got them, the videos. I can't even show you a scrubbed out version. I can't even show you just the burning of churches. And I try to help the conservatives understand. I'm a conservative, but I really, I'm an independent. A lot of times the left point the way. They show us, you know, something is wrong. Now their solution is off because they're not depending on God. They're not humble. And really they're inspired by Satan to do these acts of terror. But they're not wrong in identifying that there is a problem. And the conservatives need to understand that. That's why I would say I'm independent. I'm just a Christian.